Hi everyone, Neil Patterson here with the Sky News Daily and today the podcast is going to prison. Look, certainly this is a topic that has been very much in the news for, for quite some time. You'll be aware of long-standing problems when it comes to drugs, violence inside prisons and uh, just a warning, we will be discussing issues around self-harm amongst prisoners. Uh, but more recently, overcrowding has meant that on two separate occasions, prisoners have had to be released early. And with the budget fast approaching, plenty of people are wondering, is there more cash available to sort out the prison estate? Sky News has been granted very rare access to our prisons, very specifically HMP Elmley on the Isle of Sheppey in Kent. When we visited, it was operating at close to 100%. We went inside, in essence, to give you a snapshot of the state of our prisons. Sky's Molly Malone was the reporter we sent behind bars and she's on the podcast <laughs> with us. Molly, good to see you. Look, uh, getting inside prisons is no small feat. So, so take us back to that day. You enter the prison estate. What's it like? What, what was the first impression that you got at that point? So people might expect this, but you can't go in with absolutely anything. So I left my phone in the car, I left my bag in the car, I left everything and actually the cameraman bought his passport as his kind of form of id and they said oh no you can't say that and leave that with us lock it in the locker it's identity theft we you know we don't want that to happen on the way in so it's like literally just so odd actually you know not even knowing the time and then once you go through security which in itself takes a while it's just gate after gate after gate after gate to get anywhere it was a very nice day actually on that morning as we were heading in and then as soon as you're in you're hit by the noise. That was the thing that really stuck out to me. It was instant, just as the minute you walk in past security, it's just everywhere. So, yeah, obviously, time in the fresh air is really, really important. It was a kind of sensory kind of overload. Where's the cameras? Yeah? You don't like cameras, man. You don't like the cameras. What? Are you filming us, man? Like, even now, I'm like, I'm listening to you like this, because I'm like, oh. <laughs> when, it's, when it's full on, yeah. And you've got everybody out really at the loud. Same time. I guess this is as cool. Even on the kind of quieter wings that we went throughout the day, even then it was noisy. It was just around every corner there was someone screeching or someone shouting. It was just constant. Sounds like bedlam. This yeah. isn't even one of the, like, they'd say the worst prisons, right? They were much more overcrowded. Some of the prisons are at, like, 130% capacity. This, at points, has been operating at 96, 97 in the last six months. But this wasn't one of the terrible ones, in a sense. Presumably, though, at the very beginning of this visit to prison, you've got to be briefed on safety and and so on. Again, just kind of walk me through that. Yeah, so as soon as we came through security, we went into a briefing and that was kind of what to expect from the day. And then the governor was just sort of saying, look, it's a Friday, you will see people out and about, it's busy, but it's unpredictable. And literally as she said that word, an alarm went off. The duty governor is the guy that's managing the wings. He's in charge that day. And his walkie-talkie was just going off and it turned out that a member of staff had been assaulted, so he had to leave the briefing. Across the prison state, it's quite normal. You've got tension, you've got frustration, you've got staff members being assaulted. Are they all right? Yeah, I've just had an update, actually, yeah. And we may get to meet him because he said he would like to stay on duty. OK, that's good. Probably a little bit. If he's all right? Yeah, I want him to be all right. OK. What's really important for us now is to capture the evidence so that we can refer the assault to the police. Yeah. But what we, what we do find is they don't always progress to an outcome. Okay. Um, it's, yeah, it's very challenging. Also, we take them all very seriously. Oh, yeah. Let me come up. <laughs> so, yeah, we have lots of support for staff, and unfortunately that does happen. Yeah, yeah. Staff well-being is so critical. Yeah. So within 20 minutes, 25 minutes, an incident had already happened. And actually later on, we spoke to Officer Price where it happened on his wing and he said it doesn't normally happen at this level. It was quite violent. He was hit to the floor uh, and, you know, he was OK. But it's common. It happens a lot across the prison state. So, so where did you go first? Because, again, you know, I think of prison as cells, corridors, stairs, mm -hmm. not much more than that. It felt like a maze. You're just sort of being led around and because of the noise, you're just, you know, you're constantly just on high alert. Mm -hmm. But the first part, so we went through reception. So they are a, a large part of a remand prison. So they've got courts processes. Mm -hmm. They're coming in and out of jail every day. So one of the officers we were with described it as pandemonium. And then we went through to the weapons scanner. Uh, we've had it in the establishment for maybe two and a half, maybe three years. 
Uh, it's a game changer for the prison service. Um, primarily used uh, to x-ray prisoners when they come into the prison um, or for security searches to see whether or not they've got any thing in, inside their bodies or on them. What do you see? Are you seeing more weapons? Uh, yeah, I'm part of the security team at Elmi, so we want to recover we weapons, mobile phones, drugs, um, photos that they shouldn't have, letters they shouldn't have, um, anything that could compromise the security of the jail. So it's not just a just a normal metal detector, kind of a gate that you walk through. What, what no, is... it's a, a full body scanner, and it can see through the body, so it can see where if people are hiding it. Wouldn't internally have as well. Internally as well. So where next then? What is the scale? of this place. So after that briefing we went to the induction wing which they call house block one. I, we know them as wings, they call them house blocks and this is where people are meant to stay for the first kind of few nights. Sometimes it's more like a couple of weeks as their needs are assessed and it's decided which wing that they actually need to be on. So is it the substance misuse wing? Is right. it, are they a sex offender? That's on another wing. They keep certain prisoners separate from each other. Just to explain for those who don't understand, yeah. I mean, why would someone convicted of sex crimes be, be placed in a different part of the prison. So they described them, it was actually a term that a prisoner used as the VPs, the vulnerable peoples, mm. that's what they're called. And it's certain types of offenders that they keep separate from the general population because of their crime types, because they would say they're vulnerable perhaps to, I don't know, get in a fight with other types of prisoners. Um, oh, it's loud, isn't it? It is. So this, this is, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, this is one of the quieter ones. Is it? We've got the, on here. Why is it quiet now? Are they not now when they're coming from exercise? Yeah, so we, we were talking to a man called Officer Price and it was on that wing where the staff was, member was assaulted that morning. And he just sort of talked about how frustration builds up. As the weather's changed now, the weather's got colder, so the heating's come on, but obviously where the weather's been a bit odd at the moment, where it's a bit hotter than it would normally be this time of year, you, when you're in a cell, them cells get hot. So hotter is proven to make people less patient and then it means that there's more chance of violence going up and self-harm going up because they are spending so much time looking at the same four walls. Um, as you say, one of my staff is sorted this morning. Uh, it's sort of, that's the ultimate proof in the pudding that those sort of conditions do make things more challenging. What does your staff kind of worry about? What are they stressed about at the moment? So my staff on here worry about getting home on time. Uh, obviously family time is incredibly important to all of us. So with uh, the late arrivals that we get and the sheer numbers of people we get on some nights, it means that my staff, are, most of my staff are at 10 o'clock finish but they're not getting home till a lot later, so that's a big problem for them. Um, as you can see from this morning, coming to work and not being assaulted is, is obviously a big worry for them. Again, that's so much about not only just getting home, but getting home safe and happy. Um, that's a big thing for us, uh, and just making sure that we want to provide a certain amount of care. We want to get some sort of job satisfaction where we're able to invest in somebody, supply them everything they need to achieve and become a, a member of society who's contributing, but we're not able to always provide that because of the time frames that we're working with and because of the time pressures. So to be fair, Molly, if you are working as a prison officer in a place like this, you are going to be on edge 100% of the time. If you are a prisoner in this place, it sounds like you are close to the edge 100% of the time. I mean, t tell me about some of some of the prisoners you'll have seen and, and, and maybe even spoken to. Yeah, there were points where we were just sort of watching movement, which is when they're moving from place to place throughout the course of the day. And of course, some of them were playing up to the cameras. And actually, at one point, when we were moving from one place to the next, they were, we saw what was a holding room, which is where they're keeping people before they process them. And one man, I was in the middle of an interview sort of walking, and one man started shouting, uh, this is what Elmley, the prison, this is what Elmley does, self-harm. And it, he lifted up his top and he presented himself with scars across his whole body um, that looked like to us big scars. Um, and I couldn't say whether that happened in that prison. The governor was quite quick to tell us that often people do come to prison and they've self-harmed in the past or they might have self-harmed at another prison. But self-harm is a massive problem in prison. It rose by 25% in the last year on the wow. male estate only. So it's a really, really big issue. And lots of officers and staff point out as well that tight conditions are doing that to them but that was quite quite quickly I mean that happened within an hour or two of us being there and it was quite an evocative illustration of what was happening inside prison. If as you say many of these individuals are spending 17, 18, 19 hours locked up in their cells mm -hmm. Describe to me what that must be like. You, you, you went into a few cells, didn't you? Yeah, we saw one of them, double cell and a single cell. 
And it's not nice. I mean, lots of people wouldn't expect it to be nice and lots of people don't think that it should be nice, yeah, right? Exactly. But it's prison, isn't it? It was tight. I mean, the floor space was about the size of me. You have a bed, there was a cabinet, there was a TV, uh, there was a toilet in the corner, and yeah, four small walls. I mean, can, you, can you imagine what it would be like to spend any amount of time in something that size? Mm, no, I can't, and it, and it, it can't be nice. Um, but what's interesting as well is this is a really high remand prison, mm. so a lot of people there are awaiting sentence, awaiting trial. That means that many of them, it's not mandated that they take part in employment or education because they haven't got a sentence. And the head of education there was talking about how that's a real kind of frustration for her because that means that they're kept in their cells longer mm -hmm. because they don't have anything else to do. You're only let out, let out of your cell for eating, for a, an hour exercise, uh, for education and employment. So that was interesting as well because it means bluntly that they're then spending more time behind the bars because they're not coming out. Uh, for any purposeful activity. And of course, well, there's, there is one thing they can be doing in their cells, and that's drugs. I mean, I've, mm -hmm. I've long been fascinated by the, the problem that we have when it comes to drug abuse in prisons, whether it's, you know, so many people going into the prison estate already with, with long-standing addiction, those who are looking to occupy themselves whilst they're in prison. I mean, what, what did you see when it comes to the use of narcotics there? Mm. We didn't. We, it's not, it wasn't a pro massive problem that we saw that day. Mm. It didn't, some of the prisons you hear about the smell when you walk in of cannabis yeah. or spice. Interestingly, I did say uh, to the governor, what's your biggest issue here? And she said it's drugs, but it wasn't something we necessarily noticed. But there was one moment when we went on to what they call the substance misuse wing. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's recovery addicts, people that they're trying to get off these drugs. And uh, again, you might expect this, but it was definitely the loudest. It was definitely the kind of most frenetic moment of the day. <laughs> one moment where we went on to the mental health ward which is where people are treated looked after and it struck me that you know the governor was saying yes we've got staff members who know to look out for certain symptoms yes we are trained to look after these people but we're not specialists we're not drug specialists we're not mental health specialists um, but we are we are very fortunate to have an inpatient facility yeah because i mean it's often mental health issues that people have to and I think it's, it's really important that people understand prison isn't the right place for people who are mentally unwell. And whilst we do have healthcare professionals and we do have a mental health team, there are people that should really be in hospital in, in, in my view. Um, but I think it's long been the case that prisons are, are used as a place to put people that really need effective treatment. It's tough when you get the proliferation of drugs right across the prison estate. It's a massive problem. The Chief Inspector of Prisons, Charlie Taylor, constantly talks about that in his inspections. And yet, you know, what can they do about it? People will always find ways of bringing drugs in and trading them. It's a lucrative trade. And, you know, as we said, lots of people are spending time in their cells doing drugs and not necessarily all the time at this prison but it's a real problem. Prison officers I suspect are constantly on the on the lookout for flashpoints those moments where people are, are are associating together and the one that leaps instantly to my mind which will have fallen in the time that you were were inside Elmley lunchtime what was that like? Chaotic absolutely chaotic it was just like so apparently they what they do is they get given a menu at the beginning of the week and then they pick their options mm. I guess maybe to save time they're coming out and got, option one option two so you guys literally screaming and it's just like a normal part of their day. I was talking to the governor and I, I just kept saying, what? Can't hear you. Well, what? What? Everyone's... Do you think people have climbed up to the camera? Too? No, I, I don't think that they actually have, no. And it was just, and actually interestingly, speaking to the governor, she said at points over the last sort of six months or so when they've had literally four spaces left in the prison, it's so busy. She said even the most basic of things can be a flashpoint. It just felt like a really kind of intense moment. This is a snapshot of one prison on one particular day. You, you know, this is, this, is, this is anecdote rather than empirical evidence. I get that. But when you were speaking to the prison officers, did they suggest that the chaos 
the noise, the violence, everything that you saw, did they did they suggest or, or say anything that would suggest that this was an out of the ordinary day? No, they said this is normal. This is just completely normal. And as I said, it definitely was not the worst day they've seen. So I was speaking to one female officer. I was about to say her first name there. Interestingly, they we, we weren't allowed to use their first names because the prisoners don't know them by their first names. Well, they know yeah. only their surnames. And so I won't call her by her first name, but Officer Mazmechi um, offered a really good kind of illustration of what a bad day could be like. It could be anything. It could be fighting a fire. It could be giving CPR. It could be stopping a giant fight near a riot, could be anything. Um, some days you come in and you've got all of that in one day, some days you've got none of it. I mean, no one expects to come to work to be assaulted, no one expects to come to work to see their friends or colleagues get assaulted. Um, and I don't think you should come to work to be hurt, um, but it comes with the job. Why do these prison officers turn up for the job in the morning? I mean, I, 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 I suspect you have to do the job to understand where the job satisfaction comes from, but I'm racking my brains. Mm. I think for them it's job satisfaction comes from seeing that they're changing people's lives and right now they're finding that really difficult. They're struggling because of the tight conditions, because of how many people there are there. One officer said to me that he'd like, if, if it was an option, to spend around 20 minutes to half an hour with each prisoner a day and he said that's just blown out of the water, they just don't have time for that. But interestingly I had a conversation with a couple of prisoners there, both of them were in for drug offences. There was one offender that we spoke to, a man called Timothy. He'd been there for about 27 or 28 months and he was sort of talking about what he'd seen in that time. You've got people now that break the law purposely to come back because they haven't got nowhere to live. Like I, I can name four people, top of my head, there's, there's more, that literally have caused damage to come back because they've got nowhere to live, mm. you know? That's um, a pro real problem. It is, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and they talked about this kind of revolving door of people coming in and out of prison. And homelessness is such a massive problem. Yeah, so yeah. he was talking about how people get released. And it's just, I mean, for me, even, you go out and it's like a completely different world. It was like sunny. I hadn't, you'd have no idea from the inside that it was sunny and that it was crisp and that it was a nice day. Uh, and they're just sort of sent out on their way. So many of them at the moment are being early, re like early release and... They might have only had a kind of a month at best to think about that. With the previous scheme, it was a day. You know, they have no time. And a lot of them are being released with no homes. And interestingly, a couple of them said that they're actually committing further crimes in order to be recalled back to prison because they get a roof over their head. Someone we have, has served six months a year, something like that, yeah. goes out, shoplifts, straight back in yeah. on licence. Yeah, and a lot of them are really saying and that probation are quite jittery at the moment. They're quite nervous. Actually, recalls make up, like I think, 15% of the prison population in England and Wales. Shabal Mahmood constantly talks about how 80% of offences are re-offences. Like people, yes, there will be some that are trying to get back in, but probation you're not only recalling people because of their recommitting a crime, but it might be breach of their license conditions and they might not turn up on time to their probation appointment. And it's happening so often. We also then spoke to a man called Matt. He was on remand. He'd been there for 18 months, which is much longer than the... 18 months on remand. That's time. Time, yeah. yeah. And, and just to be clear, when, when, when we say on remand, we are meaning that these are people who are in prison awaiting uh, their trial, yeah? Yeah, that's a waiting trial, a waiting sentence, a waiting guilty or not guilty. Do you think prison is setting people up for the community well at the moment? So I was just talking to the governor about this and obviously the problem we're having where, I sound like a politician there, don't I? But the problem we seem to have is where people are spending so long on remand now, they're not able to progress to prisons where perhaps they can do courses to, you know, rehabilitate, give themselves more options upon, upon release. And they might end up doing, if not the majority, all of their sentence sat on remand. With kind of recidivism rates, with, with reoffending rates where they are, with the majority of crimes being committed by people you would call criminals because they have previous convictions, I, I just wonder what the thoughts are, if, if you manage to get any of them, of those who are working in prisons, about the plans currently being consulted on by Labour to see an awful lot more... Well, non-custodial sentences for non-violent, low-level crime. Yeah, so it's really interesting. They've appointed David Gork, which is the former Justice Secretary, and politically... Conservative, people, or was a Conservative, yeah, I should say. And a lot of people were kind of looking at that being like, what? But 
that he's known for wanting to potentially abolish sentences under six months. So mm. this is the idea of, you know, we're sending more people to prison for a longer amount of time. And they appointed prisons minister in James Timpson. Lots of people will know him for being a cobbler, key cutter. But yeah. he empl employs ex-offenders. He's quite famous for saying that he thinks that a third of people behind bars shouldn't be there. Mm. And actually they should be in the community. They should be facing kind of non-custodial sentences, community we can, sentences. We can sense the direction of travel this government wishes to go in, can't yeah. we? Yeah, and it's and it's different, and it is a kind of big step change. I think at the moment they're very much still, they would say, in their kind of emergency stage. They've still got early release. They've still got home detention curfews. So they've just extended that kind of house arrest from six months to 12 months, which, again, is quite a big kind of measure. But going forward, they're looking at sentencing review. They're looking at alternatives to custody, how they kind of toughen up community sentences so you're not seeing so many people behind bars because they just don't have the numbers. And yes, they've said as well, which is quite an awkward tension, I think, 14,000 extra prison spaces. And yet you've got a prisons minister who disagrees with that approach. So there's a big balancing act, I think, that they're going to have to kind of try and consider in the next six months or so um, as they look to really change the prison population. And, and, and of course, on top of that, next week, we've got the budget. And already I've seen two former Justice Secretaries, Robert Buckland, Alex mm. Chalk, mm. warning mm. that if there is not more money made available, prisoners are being failed and the public, more importantly, also being failed. At the moment, you've got these images of people leaving prison, popping champagne. You've got, you know, people being picked up in Hummers and, uh, you know, Rolls Royces. It's not exactly an image to the public mm. that says, hey, look, prison is working, our system's working. It's not a great look. And so if they're doing that with the money, if they're doing that kind of with the money that they've got at the moment, how are they going to convince the public that they need more money to make it better? When you think back on your day at HMP Elmley, you know, weeks, months, years from now to come, what one moment is going to be the one that sticks with you, do you think? I think the most memorable moment for me, just because of looking at him illustratively, it was the self-harm moment and thinking, what are those people going through? What What's happening to them for, that, for those scars to happen on him? But the, the kind of policy question that stuck with me is both of those prisoners, both of them said people just want to be back here. They don't want to be outside because outside is not very attractive. And if we don't have probation working, if they're worried, if they're recalling people, if the housing's not there, if the support's not there, if what they need is not there to force them into reoffending or to force them into breaking their licence conditions and being recalled, you're literally not solving the problem of prison overcrowding at all because you're setting these people up to fail, in a sense. They're going out and they're coming back in. And their overarching problem at the moment, and it has been for years, is overcrowding. That's the emergency situation. They can't really do anything before they've got over that. And recall rates are so high at the moment. And and they continue to be a problem. And I think that really stuck out to me as like, how the hell do you fix this? Molly, it was a great bit of work. Thanks very much for joining us on the podcast. Molly's visit was arranged by the Ministry of Justice and as such, they've not responded directly to her reporting on that day. But on previous occasions, they have said this regarding prisons. We inherited prisons in crisis within days of collapse and are implementing measures such as the review of sentencing to ensure we never again have more prisoners than prison spaces. We were forced to introduce an early release programme to stop a crisis that would have overwhelmed the criminal justice system, meaning we would no longer be able to lock up dangerous criminals and protect the public. The government have also pledged to recruit 1,000 more trainee probation officers by March 2025. That's your lot for this edition of The Daily. We'll see you again soon.